The word tendinopathy refers to a tendon that is structurally intact, but with abnormal tissue. It's a clinical syndrome characterized by persistent, localized tendon pain and loss of function. Tendinopathy most commonly occurs as a result of repeated mechanical loading or overuse. Historically, overuse tendinopathy was sometimes referred to as tendinitis. That itis suffix implied that inflammation was central to the pathological process. But during the 1990s, surgical biopsies from ruptured and symptomatic tendons revealed that the pathophysiology underlying most cases actually involved very few inflammatory cells and that the condition was actually due to a failed healing response within the tendon tissue. As a result, the prevailing view became that tendinopathy was essentially a degenerative condition caused by repeated mechanical loading and that it was not an inflammatory condition. The term tendinitis fell out of favour and the terms tendinopathy and tendinosis became more commonly used. Then in the early noughties, research was conducted showing the presence of iron-containing macrophages in affected tissues, suggesting that the innate immune system, and therefore inflammation, was somehow involved in the condition. Further research then revealed the widespread presence of neovessels and chemicals like substance P in tendons in patients with long-standing tendinopathy, corroborating earlier evidence that elements of the inflammatory response are indeed present in chronic tendinopathy. The confusion was nicely summarized in a 2018 systematic review on the topic. The authors concluded that prior to 2012, the majority of published reviews did not discuss monocytes, macrophages, or lymphocytes in tendinopathy. Rather, they focused on the lack of neutrophils. The authors proposed that this neutrophil focused definition of inflammation probably contributed to the idea that the pathophysiology was entirely non-inflammatory. We now know that an inflammatory response does occur in affected tendons, as evidenced by the presence of macrophages I mentioned before, and an increase in cyclooxygenase 2, interleukin 6, and prostaglandin E2 expression even in long-standing cases, as well as the presence of vascular disruption. Why is this history important? Well, the inconsistencies in clinical nomenclature and also the lack of a pathophysiological understanding has meant that we are still trying to figure out the best approaches to the diagnosis and management of tendinopathy. So to clarify what a normal tendon looks like and what happens during tendinopathy. Normal tendon is a well-organized network of collagen fibrils. The extracellular matrix is dense with the fibrillary network of predominantly parallel aligned collagen fibers principally consisting of type 1 collagen. The extracellular matrix is composed of proteoglycans, glycosaminoglycans, and glycoproteins, including small leucine-rich proteoglycans. In tendinopathy, tenocytes are decreased in volume, becoming longer and slender. They have an increased nucleus to cytoplasm ratio and produce less extracellular matrix, with an increase in type 3 collagen density mostly owing to less degradation. The upshot of all of this is that healthy tendons can withstand, store, and then deliver substantial force to perform day-to-day -day activities. But healthy tendons can become tendinopathic when the repetition, speed, or total force of loading is substantially increased. The pathogenesis of tendinopathy is multifactorial and complex. Different studies have led to lots of different theories around the pathophysiology of tendinopathy. I'm not going to go into these theories in detail, but ultimately the pathological process seems to start with repetitive tendon overload, and this leads to structural injury of the microscopic collagen fibrils under normal circumstances, injury to the tendon matrix triggers an effective healing response. But poor intrinsic healing quality of the tendon or a lack of adequate recovery might lead to gradual accumulation of damage over time. These initial structural alterations are typically clinically silent and asymptomatic, but the progressive accumulation of matrix damage and the secretion of cytokines, chemokines, inflammatory mediators, and activated nociceptors eventually manifest in symptoms. 
Now, why do some people develop tendinopathy and others don't? Well, there are lots of recognized risk factors for tendinopathy, and these are usually divided into intrinsic risk factors, which relate to the properties of the person's tendon or their healing ability, and extrinsic factors, which relate to the amounts and types of load placed on the tendon. Among these many factors, advancing age, an intrinsic risk factor, and increased overall volume of tendon load, an extrinsic risk factor, pose the greatest risk for developing overuse tendinopathy. Being over 35 years of age is associated with an increased incidence of many overuse tendinopathies, because as tendons age, they lose their energy storing capacity and their ability to repair quickly. Gender strongly influences the risk of developing certain tendinopathies too. The influence of gender on tendinopathy is not well understood, but may represent a combination of biomechanical variables like hip to knee angles, hormonal influences like estrogen levels and menopausal status, and different sporting or occupational behaviors. Prior tendon lesions also represent a significant intrinsic risk factor for developing tendinopathy. In high-risk groups, like athletes participating in jumping sports, asymptomatic lesions identified on ultrasound at the start of the season have been associated with an increased risk of developing a symptomatic tendinopathy during the season. More recently, clinicians have come to appreciate the role of metabolic diseases in tendinopathy. The most common example is diabetes mellitus. Not only are diabetic patients more likely to develop tendinopathy, they also don't respond as well to treatment. Even in the absence of discrete diagnoses, a relatively small increase in waist size is a risk factor for tendinopathy. Extrinsic risk factors for overuse tendinopathy include training errors, like a sudden increase in tendon loading, activity, or inadequate rest, poor environmental conditions, like running on cambered road surfaces, or performing gymnastics on hard gym floors, inadequate equipment like old or inappropriate footwear, or premature return to sport after injury. Of these risk factors, sudden substantial increases in training load without adequate time for the body to adjust, for example, if your patient was to double their cumulative running distance from one week to the next, incurs the greatest risk. Suboptimal ergonomics play a role in the development of many upper extremity tendinopathies. Excessive movement or awkward postures involving the hand, wrist or shoulder during daily or occupational activities can strain tendons. Finally, certain medications increase the risk of acute and chronic tendinopathy, and all of these intrinsic and extrinsic risk factors for tendinopathy are summarised on screen. Patients with tendinopathy tend to report having soreness and stiffness in the morning or after being still for a long period of time. A characteristic of many tendinopathies is the delayed appearance of more severe pain, termed latency. During loading of the tendon, for instance during exercise like running, your patient may experience a short-lived increase in pain at their tendon initially, but this subsides as exercise continues. But after a few hours, your patient starts to experience more severe pain that is worse than those baseline levels. This is why screening is so important, because early symptoms are often considered to be benign. In the athletic population, the Oslo Sports Trauma Research Centre Overuse Injury Questionnaire can be a useful way to detect early symptoms and their progression. Ultrasonography can be used to detect alterations in tendon properties that are risk factors for developing symptoms of tendinopathy, like increased tendon thickness and degenerative changes. Alterations in tendon properties without clinical symptoms can also result in altered central nervous system control and adapted muscle activation. So close monitoring of athletes with changes in tendon structure is recommended to enable early intervention if there is a change in either function, symptoms, or both. When making a diagnosis of tendinopathy, most of the important information can be garnered through a detailed clinical examination that determines whether your patient has a history of load-related tendon pain and a physical examination. For tendons that can be palpated easily, like the Achilles, localized tenderness can confirm the diagnosis. 
in more deeply located tendons like the rotator cuff tendons, confirming the diagnosis with palpation alone can be difficult. This is where pain provoking tests can play a role. I won't go into the details of each test's specificity and sensitivity or how to perform them, but displayed on screen is a list of tests for the Achilles, patellar, gluteal, elbow and rotator cuff tendinopathy or tendons. You will see how for each anatomical location, palpation is considered an important diagnostic test. Unfortunately, the latency of symptoms and the tendency of patients to consider them benign means that many will present to you in the late stages of tendinopathy. These patients may have symptoms that have lasted longer than three months. The difficulty is that once symptoms are present, tendinopathy can be refractory to treatment. Lots of rehabilitation strategies have been recommended for patients with tendinopathy. These therapeutic regimens can be divided into passive modalities, which includes pharmacological treatments, injection therapy, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, therapeutic ultrasonography, and low-level laser, and active modalities like exercise, patient education, and load management. Of all of these, exercise regimens or tendon loading programs are considered to be the most effective conservative approach in the treatment of tendinopathy. Over the years, specific types of exercise regimes have gone in and out of fashion. In the 1990s, eccentric training became popular, redirecting a management approach that was, until then, largely based on anti-inflammatory medications and passive treatment strategies. The success of eccentric exercise led to the presumption that isolated eccentric muscle contractions were needed to provide clinical benefit. But this has since been refuted. We now know that a mix of contraction types, eccentric, concentric and isometric, all provide benefit in the treatment of tendinopathy. So although eccentric exercise works, your decision as to what tendon loading program to prescribe should be individualized and made with your patient. Basically, a dogmatic prescription of eccentric exercise for all patients with tendinopathy should be avoided. You should engage with your patients and present the different treatment options to them. The optimal program might simply be the one that your patient is more likely to stick to. With this in mind, performing tendon loading exercise can often induce pain and patients report a fear of causing further damage when the loading program leads to pain. This fear might in turn prevent your patient from sufficiently loading the tendon which actually might be necessary to cause meaningful clinical changes. Hence, it's vital that you inform your patient about the importance of proper tendon loading and that you make them aware that pain is allowed both during and after the program exercises. The pain monitoring model is a nice way to facilitate patient understanding of the amount of pain that is allowed during and after exercise. So how long do these tendon loading programs need to be followed? Well, the recovery and healing of tendons can take anywhere between 6 and 12 months. And as an example, even though a recent systematic review investigating the use of exercise for the treatment of Achilles tendinopathy, patients continued to have symptoms at 12 weeks. Studies with longer follow-up periods have shown continued improvements up to one year after program initiation. So the exercise treatment might therefore need to be continued for longer than 12 weeks and patients will be of great importance for achieving full recovery. What if your patient doesn't respond favorably to loading interventions? In these cases, other treatment options may be explored as adjuncts or alternatives. The trouble is that many of these adjunctive therapies have a limited evidence of efficacy. For example, even though corticosteroid injections have been a mainstay of treatment for tendon-related disorders for many years, their effectiveness is controversial. The issue is that research has shown that corticosteroid injection might impair the physiological healing response of local tissues, leading to progression of the disease. Recent studies have shown that corticosteroid injections are no better than placebo and may actually worsen outcomes in patients with rotator cuff, lateral elbow, patellar and Achilles tendinopathy. Another controversial treatment involves the injection of platelet-rich plasma or PRP 
a preparation of autologous blood centrifuge to contain a high concentration of platelets at the site of tendinopathy. Results are inconsistent with systematic reviews showing little to no benefit over placebo for lateral elbow, patellar or Achilles tendinopathy. Likewise, studies of low-level laser therapy, which is said to reduce inflammation and edema, induce analgesia and promote healing in a range of musculoskeletal pathologies are inconsistent. Several systematic reviews have shown inconclusive results for the use of low-level laser therapy in the treatment of rotator cuff, lateral elbow, and Achilles tendinopathy. And there are lots of other treatment strategies, including extracorporeal shockwave therapy, prolotherapy, sclerotherapy, high-volume injections, acupuncture, dry needling and mobilization, friction massage, thermotherapy, and stretching. But all of these are undermined by a lack of high quality research and inconclusive findings. Topical glycerol trinitrate though is considered a safe and reliable treatment or adjunct for the management of tendinopathy. A recent systematic review of RCTs showed significant improvements in pain in those receiving topical glycerol trinitrate compared with placebo in the short term, along with further significant improvements for up to six months. Now if a conservative management strategy fails, the next step is often a surgical consultation. Surgical procedures for tendinopathy involve excision of the degenerative tendon, the removal of adhesions around the tendon, decompression of the tendon, and multiple longitudinal tenotomies. Surgical procedures have advanced over the years from open techniques to minimally invasive approaches using arthroscopy or through percutaneous incisions under image guidance. Generally speaking, it is reasonable to consider surgical consultation if your patient experiences no improvement after 6 to 12 months of diligently following a well-designed tendon loading program in combination with adjunctive medical treatments and when other conditions have been excluded or managed. The trouble with surgery is that a successful outcome is not guaranteed and results are, again, belied by the quality of the available research. For example, two systematic reviews concluded that the degree of success claimed in surgical studies of tendinopathy repair correlates inversely with the quality of the study. So the lower the quality of the study, the higher the likelihood of a positive outcome. You see, we have to be careful when using these kind of direct comparisons between separate studies because in most cases, surgery was a kind of last resort intervention and the patient cohorts were not equivalent. The reality is that loading programs improve symptoms in certain patients, but up to 30% don't respond as well. In these cases, surgery could be a viable option. And that's where the field of tendinopathy research is heading to identify new drugs and agents that can improve disease in those patients who are non-responders to loading programs or exercise regimens. This is an exciting area and bringing together advances in regenerative medicine, gene therapy and nanotechnology, but we're just not there yet in terms of real-world clinical trial data.